Hello, and welcome to Book Reviews Kill, a podcast about fantasy, science fiction, and horror novels. I'm Evan. And I'm Chad. And today, Chad and I are recapping and discussing The City of Brass, book one in the Devabad trilogy by S.A. Chakraborty. I really like these first episodes, because whenever we start a new series, we can kind of get to clarify a lot of things with each other that maybe one of us wasn't super clear on. And to be honest, there was a lot in this book that I wasn't super clear on. <laughs> I feel like I'm holding a delightful thing of yarn, and it's a little tangled. And I'm hoping Pretty tonight tangled. we can kind of untangle it together. And um, the next episode, I'm sure, will be, you know, all of the insightful, wise things that we typically have to say. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to need some help unraveling this yarn ball tonight, my friend. Right. I mean, other than how complex and, you know, political this book is, let's talk about the atmosphere that we got to experience with this because I haven't really seen this in any anything else that I've read. Chakraborty did such an amazing job at plopping us right down into this. What is this? Um, 18th century, yeah. um, like Na- Napoleonic, like Franks yeah, and Napoleon Ottomans. Napoleon is and... like invading, but there's like still Egypt. Like we're not quite technology yet. We still have swords and stuff, and obviously, you know, we're going down the magic road. But it like it's a weird mixture of almost tech, right? And you know. I mean, I'm sure that there are fantasy series that are in a, a setting that's similar to this, but I mean, not very many at not very all. Many. The only thing I can kind of think of is like the demon cycle. Right. Or um, I think like our, our Scott Baker has a, a kind of like Middle Eastern inspired fantasy that I haven't read yet, but they're so, so few and far between. And I'm so excited that we get to read that together. Me also. I also, just so you know, in case we need it, have the entire Prince Ali song from Aladdin in my notes. I'm not sure why I added it in here, but it is in here. Well, because there's multiple parts. <laughs> I mean, uh, like Ali Zaid. Uh, Al Katani, yeah. such a cool name. Uh, but a bunch of people keep calling him Prince Ali, and we've all. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> every time that. I hear Prince Ali, I see Ali above. Yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, and so I think that's why I wrote the whole song down. It, it's actually a really clever song. I don't know if you've ever seen the lyrics for it, but there's like definitely words in there that are not for children. Like they're not adult, but they're like way beyond the average understanding of like a five year old, you know? <laughs> yeah, those, those Disney songwriters. I learned a lot <laughs> on it. But yeah, really impressive book here. I mean, there were a few moments that I was definitely mired in kind of the setup for a very complicated world. There's a lot of political intrigue in here. Yes. A lot of uh, history as well. You know, the world building is so much more in depth than I was really thinking it would be. You know, I hadn't seen too many reviews for these books, but I never saw a review that said this is a lot of world building and um like political intrigue and and depth with different you know factions and tribes right. and wasn't really ready for it i definitely got pretty confused as to like who was uh, you know Man, tied there's to tribes what. and history and yeah and and different um like allegiances and, and genealogies and i was kind of confused with like you know you have like the gaziri like the main um, family, the royal family, but there were other people from other tribes that were working with them, like in the household, kind of. Yeah. And I did, I thought they were all Gaziri, but some of them weren't, and they had like different allegiances. But one thing I will say that I thought was really impressive about this book, and I really liked it, and it's, it's making me really excited about the second book and the third book, is that it's all so morally ambiguous it's all so gray like yeah. each yeah each faction i or don't tribe, know who's the good exactly like n- there's no way of knowing because it's like as soon as a little bit of history is uncovered you're like okay i think i've got a, a bead on on who these people are and then there's some more history that's uncovered by a different tribe and it's like oh they're terrible oh my right. god and then there's even more and it's like well they you're had like, to be the good terrible guys are, like, because hiding of those this. bodies i know <laughs> right exactly so i think chakraborty did an excellent job at creating this world and creating a place where i'm so happy to be living while i'm reading this it's just the plot was difficult and the it's like a seven lane on ramp right i mean it was it took me about till i i read a lot of this on my kindle because this is all on kindle unlimited which is great Ooh. um yeah it's awesome i love i just got the kindle oasis so <laughs> i like anyway oh, and it's oasis it's so desert themed i know that's very apropos it took me until about 70 percent in to where i felt like i knew what was going on I was comfortable with everybody's names and and it's not really like a a hit against the book really i mean when you're setting up epic fantasy like this things are just complicated at first right complicated ingredients can make a really good result yeah i mean i'm pretty interested to see where all of this goes because the ending 
of this book was excellent. Like really, mm-hmm. it, the ending completely made up for how confused I was for the first like third, like two, oh, like two. One hundred percent agree. Of the book. Yeah. And still, am a little confused on some things. But you know, over the years, especially with my memory just not being a, a finely honed machine, I've grown very good at just kind of suspending my need to know everything and it's always answered in the long run or not and i enjoy the ride yeah it's a weird line because um sometimes it kind of does have an effect on my enjoyment of something when i do feel like i have to let so much stuff wash over me so that i can just get to the meat of what's actually going on but this towed the line pretty well it did uh, because of the atmosphere the immersion there's some really awesome characters in here the i really like ali and nari a lot yeah, um, me too. did not really like dara the whole time did not like wasn't a big fan of Dara even yep. a little bit. He was a little like one sided. Yeah, I, agree. I didn't even fall for like the uh, you know the bad boy with a troubled past. Like kind of, <laughs> I was just like, nah, this guy's an ass. Like I don't like anything about him. And I don't know if we were supposed <laughs> the to bad think boy that. with a troubled. Past. Oh yeah, that, that's such a such a great trope. I love that trope. But uh, even I don't I don't think that that trope was employed like super well here. He was just kind of just an ass the entire time yeah. i mean he's sympathetic to a point but not sympathetic enough for me mm-hmm. like personally um i liked him for the first like five minutes i was really into him and then mm, he kind of lost yeah. me i just like the idea of like genies and gins you know that's awesome totally i don't know there were some things that that definitely kind of fell a little bit flat for me and we'll totally get into those but like yeah i would say for the most part this is a really excellent book and i'm very excited to see what else happens in this trilogy but for yeah. this episode i think um you know the first one in a trilogy this will be good for us to kind of just clarify some stuff with each other, get a little bit more clear on maybe some questions that I know I've got some questions. You've got some questions. Hopefully we Absolutely. can answer each other's questions. And if you're listening right now and you just read this book, maybe we'll answer some of yours as well. Hopefully I'm uh, I have to give Shocker Bordy the kudos on the visualization. At no point was I like, I don't see what she's talking about. Like right. there were some especially a few very specific scenes that were just just magical like really really cool and laid out very her blocking was really good Mm -hmm. and i was just like man it was was really pretty and magical and i really like that you could tell that she had a real hard vision for Mm -hmm. what all of this was maybe too hard of a vision to the point where it was so figured out in her head (laughs) that she was like are you along for this ride and it's like yeah i want to be but i'm still kind of back here trying to untangle this whole you know this entire yeah like this uh, the glossary in the uh in the in the back of the book was very or the front of the book i should say was very nice yeah there's a whole lot to love here and i'm uh, i'm excited to get into it let's go all right the book starts in the 18th century in a Cairo street booth run by Nari, a 20-year-old healer and fortune teller. A man claiming illness comes to Nari for help, and we learn she does have the ability to sense he's actually healthy and that his companion is the one actually ill, although he does not know it yet. We also learn she has the gift for languages, to understand them without having to learn them, and she doesn't quite look Egyptian, although she believes she is. Later that evening, Nari attends a czar, a ceremony meant to drive jinn spirits from women. She uses these events to earn extra money, leading the singing and music, though she doesn't believe in the spirits or magic in general. During the czar, Nari sings one of the songs in her natural language, one she's never heard another person speak. This gets an odd reaction from Basima, the girl who's supposedly possessed. She then hears a voice say, Who are you? from an unknown source. After the czar, Nari heads home through a local cemetery when she sees Basima following her. Basima, who seems to actually be possessed, appears to know what Nari is, talking about testing her blood and mentioning the Marid. As Basima gets aggressive, a jinn named Dara appears speaking Nari's native tongue. We learn Nari unknowingly called him when she sang the song in Devasti during the czar. She admits she healed others before, and this seems to interest him. The cemetery's dead, led by Ifrit Basima, begin rising and attack Nari and Dara. Basima calls Nari the newest Banu Nahida, who are all supposedly dead, and calls Dara Afshin. The two are able to escape by enchanting a carpet to fly. Nari wakes at an oasis next to the Afshin, whom she begins to question. He's insulted when she asks if he's a jinn and claims he's a deva and that the jinn are traitors. He also refuses her his name, saying Afshin is a title. 
Nari explains her odd powers and unknown origin, which leads Dara to believe she's part Nahid, though he claims that the Nahids would never have consorted with a human. He explains Shafit means something with mixed blood between Deva and humans, and that the Nahid were a family of Deva healers. After a conversation with a bird-like creature named Kajur, Dara tells Nari he's taking her to Devabad her true home and only safe haven from the Ifrit on their trail. We then switch perspectives to Prince Alizade al Katani in Devabad, a hidden island covered in enchantments and populated by Jin tribes. The tribes are separated into distinct districts within the city walls, with a quarter dedicated to Shafit, whom Ali believes are being treated as second-class citizens. Ali is the son of King Ghassan al Katani a Kaziri man committed to maintaining peace between the tribes. With his generous income and knowledge of the royal family's treasury, Ali has been funding a Shafit uprising called the Tenzin, though he insists the funds only be used on food and education. Ali confronts a man named Anas amid rumors that his funding is being used to purchase weapons. Anas takes Ali to meet another Shafit named Hano and learns of a trading ring where devas steal Shafit babies and sell them to Deva struggling to conceive. Royal guards arrive, and Anas stays behind to delay the guards so the others can escape, imploring Ali to make his sacrifice worthwhile. On the road to Devabad, Nari plans to desert Dara, but first decides to steal his ring while he sleeps. Upon touching the ring, she has a vision of Dara, enslaved by a human and forced to help destroy a city. Dara wakes up, and her plan to escape is botched. He's surprised at her eagerness to escape, saying she's needed in Devabad because she's the last of the healers. Dara tells his full name and explains that Deva have souls but are created from fire instead of earth. He explains the history of Deva, once the most powerful creatures on earth. After years of abusing this power on humans, a human named Suleiman obtained a mystical ring that allowed him to suppress the Deva's powers and strip them of shape-shifting abilities, making them take human form and live shorter lifespans. He also ordered them to work for humans as slaves. Those who didn't obey became ifrit, stuck in bodies that don't age, but without powers. They went mad, and to this day seek revenge on humanity and the deva who submitted to Suleiman. Suleiman gave his ring to the deva he trusted most, Anahid, the first of the Nahids. The Nahids then became the rulers and named their tribe the deva. They were afraid another Suleiman-like ruler would appear again and destroy them if they mingled in any way with the humans, so they became notorious for killing any Shafit and discouraging mixing with them at all. We learn the Afshin were warriors for the deva, and because the Nahids were the ones who enforced Suleiman's rules, the Ifrit hated them and sought their destruction. Because Nari is their descendant, they also want to kill her. As they keep traveling, sparks fly between Dara and Nari until he admits his plan to leave her at the gate to Devabad. He explains more of their history. 1400 years ago, the Gaziri, another Deva tribe that was much more open to mixing with humans, revolted against the Deva tribe and overthrew the Nahids, ultimately taking power. Nari praises the Gaziri for protecting the Shafit, which causes Dara to desert her in the middle of the night. Meanwhile, in Devabad, Ali learns that Asan was captured and tortured for information about the Tanzim. Asan reveals nothing, and the Gaziri sentence him to death by trampling under the feet of a giant beast called the Karkadan. Ali watches all of this with horror, but betrays nothing of his involvement. After the execution, we meet Ali's brother and future king of Devabad, Muntadir. Ali is training to be his cave, or leader of the guard. The king demands harsh rules for the Shafit in order to quell any further revolt. Ali argues for the Shafit's rights, but his father claims there is not enough housing and jobs for everyone, and he must appease the Deva, whose land they are on. At the same time, they can't let them leave because they can cause trouble for the humans, which in turn might bring another Suleiman. The king then announces they found boxes of weapons on Shafit rebels, confirming Ali's fears that his funds have been misused. The current Cade must leave. 
so Ali becomes interim Cade and moves into the palace. He takes on a new secretary, who turns out to be working with the Tanzim. Nari and Dara are traveling to Devabad when a giant predatory bird attacks them and eats Dara. Though he is able to escape the bird's stomach, he is badly injured, and Nari attempts to heal his wounds. In the process, she discovers that Dara is not technically alive. The two share a kiss, but are interrupted by Ifrit, who claim they've made a bargain with Nari's mother, Manaze, thought dead the past 20 years. Nari is able to kill an Ifrit with a knife coated in her own blood. A Marid rises up from the river, scattering the Ifrit. It attacks Nari and Dara, but the two are saved by the Peri Kejur, who dies in the process. Just before he dies, he says the Paris and Marid are after Dara, not Nari. Dara and Nari finally make it to the ferry to take them to the island of Devabad. Dara explains they can't touch the water in the lake because it's cursed by the Marid to destroy Deva. Ali goes to his father, who accuses him of not going after the Shafit. A messenger comes in saying a Deva slave with an Afshin mark is on the ferry, but the king dismisses it, upset with Ali and threatening to send him away. The king hints at something he's set up which will cause the Shafit to riot, allowing for the arrest of multiple potential members of the Tanzim. After the meeting, Muntadir confronts Ali, suspecting he's sympathetic to the Shafit cause. He takes Ali to a crypt under the castle, where all the bodies of the Nahid are buried, a cruel fate for beings from fire that are normally cremated when they die. Muntadir then shows Ali a relic that all Deva have that allow them to be returned to a body if they're enslaved by the Ifrit. The relic is Dara's, which Ali realizes means that it was his family who turned Dara over to the Ifrit to be enslaved. Muntadir says they had to do it because Dara would have destroyed them all during the war when Ali's family took over. Muntadir says the man in the ferry can't be Dara because without the relic, he shouldn't have been able to return to a body. Torn between his support for the Shafit and his family, Ali tells his brother he'll stop supporting the Tanzim. Nari and Dara enter the city right as the riot is starting between the Shafit and the Deva. Dara moves to protect the Devas, but the city guard intervenes and takes them to see the king. When the king looks upon Nari, he mistakes her for Manaze. The king realizes she's not Manaze, but says that she's clearly a pureblood, and there must be an enchantment on her if everyone else thinks she looks like a Shafit. Nahir swears fealty to him in exchange for her and Dara's well-being. Nari begins training in the infirmary with her mother's old assistant, Nisreen. Dara goes off on an expedition with Muntadir to track the Ifrit hunting them. The king confronts Ali, saying he knows he's been funding the Shafit revolt, although it's clear the king isn't aware to what extent Ali is involved, and says if he wants to live, he has to help get Nari on their side. The king wants her to marry Muntadir so they can have peace between the two tribes. Nari and Ali begin spending time together. He begins teaching her how to read and a guarded friendship begins to form. Meanwhile, Nari struggles to heal people, causing more harm than good. Dara returns and isn't happy with how close she's gotten to Ali, but she claims he's a mark. Ali is attacked by one of the Tanzim, upset he's abandoned them, but he's able to kill the Shafit and go to Nari for healing. Dara knows the king wants to arrange a marriage between Nari and Muntadir so he tries to point her to Jamshid, a deva who's the son of the wazir and guard to Muntadir. This upsets Nari, as she wants to marry Dara, but he says it cannot be. It's unlikely he can have children, as he's basically dead, and the Nahid need to come back. Needing medical attention and not wanting to be seen, Ali goes to Nari. Dara is there, and they begin to fight. Dara reveals he has powers devas typically don't possess, as he begins magically changing items around him. He defeats Ali and threatens to kill him if Nari refuses to escape with him. She agrees, and the three set off. Summoning a hidden magical craft from the water, Dara leads Ali and Nari on board, quickly casting off. As Nari desperately attempts to strike a deal to save Dara, his eyes glaze and he begins killing with abandon as the ships erupt in violence. Dara's attention is focused on Muntadir in an adjacent ship. 
As Ali goes to save his brother, Dara shoots him with a few arrows, the impact of which throws Ali overboard into the Deathly Lake. Coming back to himself, Dara is stricken, realizing he is responsible for Ali's death. Ali, however, climbs back on the ship, though he is now possessed by a Marid and bears Suleiman's seal on his cheek. This allows him to stop Dara's power and cut off the hand with the jeweled bracelet on it. This is what was used to enslave him, and without it, his spirit dies and his body turns to ash. Now, Nari is devastated over losing Dara. Ali wakes up in the infirmary to discover he is not possessed anymore, though the Marid left its mark. We learn the king's family took over the throne, as one of the other tribes conspired with the Marid to go after the Nahid, something that is an act of betrayal against their kind a closely guarded secret, kept by the king and his family. The king has realized the full extent of his betrayal, stripping him of his titles, planning to send him to their family's land. Ali realizes that once he is out of the public eye, his father will most likely have an assassin kill him. The king meets with Nari, as he still wants the marriage, as it will bring the revolting Deva tribe back under control. The king threatens to reveal that she is a Shafit, and will tell all that he made up the enchantment. Seemingly defeated, she agrees, but upon executing the king's narrative that Dara attempted to rape and kidnap her, the devas stand by her, and she calls the king her mark. The book ends with the wazir Keva going to see his son, Jamshid, who was gravely injured during the battle on the boat. The king refused him treatment until the deva turned over whoever helped Dara plan his escape. Keva begins scraping a tattoo off his son, and we learn Jamshid must be a Nahid, as he can heal himself. The tattoo's purpose is to stop this power and hide his true nature, but now it's keeping Jamshid from healing himself. Nisreen appears and stops him, assuring him he will live, stressing they can't let the king find out about Jamshid. She reveals an iron ring with an emerald in it, which looks to be Dara's ring, and informs him he can still be saved if Keva can get back in the king's good graces. He must get permission to go to their homeland and take the ring to Menezé to revive Dara. Whew. Oh, okay. Oh I'm boy, out of breath. that was a lot of things. There was a lot <laughs> there of things. So many things. As I was reading, there was a few paragraphs, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> Because it was just like, and the Manizé brought the Tashim and the Rang. And the... Yeah, it's a lot. It's I don't even, oh man, I don't even know where to oh, start just here. just sounding okay. out words. <laughs> Let's just start at the beginning here. Okay. Okay. I love the beginning, honestly. I thought the beginning was really good. Honestly, I'm kind of bummed we didn't get to spend more time in Cairo. Yeah, that and That would have been cool. I loved Yekub. Yeah, Yekub. What guy. happened to Yekub? Yeah, Yekub yeah. was great. So would none of this story have happened at all if Nari just didn't sing that particular song while they were doing the czar that was the catalyst yes because <laughs> she was okay. like i think i'm just gonna start singing this because she was like i think the words will sound cool in my own right. tongue and it's, it was a little odd to me that she's like able to instantly learn any language and sense what like very complicated ailments within people and then is like magic psh, totally fake it's like dude what? Yeah, I thought that was kind of strange too. Yeah, she was kind of talking down to Jakob. She was just like, yeah. all your silly superstitions, but she can like literally heal herself and other people by touching them. Yeah. And... <laughs> it's like, dude, but you're I guess, like, I mean, um, there is like a, a couple lines where uh, someone asks her, like, how are you able to do this or whatever? Um, and she kind of she has difficulty explaining because she's so used to it. Um, I think Chakraborty did a pretty good job. At, she probably caught that. It's like breathing to her. Like if you, yeah, exactly. Like if you had grown up with that, it wouldn't seem like magic to you, right? But I mean, you would still know that it was different. Yeah, I mean, than... I can have wings all my life, and I'd still know, like I'm the only one with wings. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really did like the scene where we first meet Dara. You know, he kind of like plops out of the ether, and he's super confused and annoyed. You know, he's just like, "What? What? Am, what is going on here? Why? Who he's the hell are you?" It. Yeah. Uh, just where like did he come girl. from? I have no idea. Was I he like to... floating in the like Neverland, no and then she called him to being? I don't know, man. There's a lot in this episode. This particular episode is going to be a little bit vague on some points. Yeah. I mean, I I tried my best i think 
um, like with a lot of things that we've read on here in the first book of a kind of a long series or, you know, at least like a, these are thick books, you know, weighty tomes. Um, yeah. Yeah. The first book is always, it's like, I never really know if I just didn't pick something up or if it's just something that's not, hasn't been explained yet in the text. Um, yep. so yeah, I'm just working with everything that I feel really confident that I know, but I mean, this whole story seems to basically be, you know, Nari has these powers. She didn't really know where she got them. She didn't really know where she was from. Um, but it seems like she's the last of a, a certain sect of a sect of this tribe yes. uh, that is very important to the devas, right? right. But then there's these other They're people. They're not devas, though. No, they are devas. They are devas. So all devas are, th- all of them are devas, but not all devas are them. Got it, got it. All nahids are deva, but not all devas are nahids. Copy, okay. Right. Yeah, the, the Suleiman ifrit nahid deva thing, the rings and everything, like that was a lot. That a was lot. a whole lot. I think I get it. I think I totally get it. But I hope that that's something that's cleared up a little bit more in the next book. Same. I blame Dara. He was really holding out a lot of information and he could have helped us out as readers, maybe like mumbling to himself. or something. <laughs> What did you think about the the love story between Dara and Nari? Honestly, it did not hit. It was yeah, weird it didn't to hit me. For like, me she's trying yeah. to run from him. He appears out of nowhere. She doesn't believe in magic. So was, she's like, you're a demon. And then he takes her on like a magic carpet ride. And it may be a little Steppenwolf is all, all a heart needs to soften up, you know? A magic I don't carpet know. Ride. I just never. <laughs> then, yeah, nice. I, I, I hear you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't laugh like super hard. So I was yeah. like, what? <laughs> I know. Weird. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. Um, I thought it was kind of the weakest part of the whole book. Honestly, Same. it was just like everything else was so believable. cool and believable and even though it was like i said in the intro like even though it was complicated i was still so here for all of this except the it, it, you could have lifted that right out you know yes. like them being in love or whatever it's just like i don't see it like i don't see to, like, what, marry him right and it's like what Whoa. is there the the kind of like tortured badass with a heart of gold thing it's like he doesn't even really have like a heart of gold he just feels like Ah. slighted by these um and if you i mean if you really kind of like start digging into the history of all this he's being like pretty close-minded about a lot of this stuff but you know you got to give him some credit i mean he was like a um like a used as a slave yeah exactly but still i mean like you could make because of a lot of the things that are kind of revealed as this book goes on there are arguments to be made that some of this actually is his fault um, right. Which I thought was, you know, it's so cool that we still don't know at the end of this first book who's in the right or who we should be supporting or right. There's like a theme like of self-responsibility, you know, that like, okay, yes, you're in this circumstance, but like you still are going to be held accountable for the actions that uh, you may have been able to control more than we at first were led to believe, but, I think. But like, why did you take those actions, you know, like that's the, right. you know, and then what, what led to these atrocities being committed was it other atrocities that were committed but what about those atrocities and it's right. just, it just keeps going back but i mean back to um dara and nari i just felt like like what is it that nari is seeing in dara really i mean i i think that the, the whole thing would have been quite a bit more interesting if nari started developing feelings for ali but it's just ne- that never happened either so it was just like and, you know, I'm not a huge fan of love triangles for the most part, but yeah. when they work, they work, you know, and it, it, I feel like it was there was kind of a missed opportunity here for like Nari to feel a little bit more caught between two people that she had mixed right, feelings Ali about, and, yeah. which would have been it would have like lent a lot to the situation. But it just felt like we didn't get a lot of growth from Nari because she had been through all of this, heard all this, seen all this stuff. And she's still like Team Dara, even <laughs> though it's like pretty obvious at least at this point in the story that dara is like pretty terrible yeah and, like at one point when she grabbed his ring she was like horrified right but then it's like he's got like reasons for it and so, i don't know yeah. it's just it, i wasn't feeling it i didn't i didn't care that nari couldn't get married to dara it was just like and it was supposed to be like this consequential thing and it right. didn't feel like it but uh, that was really the only thing in this book that where i was really like okay that was that was dumb <laughs> but but everything else i mean like the uh the carcadon like that giant what was the that like thing? half no it's the um the thing in the uh like the arena that kills oh uh, yeah that tramples him yeah yeah uh, it's like oh, half brutal. elephant half horse or something i kind of imagined the thing um in star wars the phantom menace 
that uh which one fights him i think uh obi-wan fights the big boar thing that charges him you know when he hooks the rings over its snouts and swings up oh that's from uh, attack of the clones oh attack of the clones i'm yeah. sorry you should be yeah I mean, how could you i know how could i forget something at two in the morning <laughs> especially as important in star wars that's actually a pretty big faux pas really. i mean episode two to be fair is like pretty Shitty. Actually, really kind of liked it. I'm not really. Gonna... Uh, it's like yeah, dude, I, I rewatched all three of the beginning ones like a couple months ago, and man, I really enjoyed them. Except for mm. every time Hayden Christensen opened his mouth. <laughs> I like Hayden Christensen. I don't care. He looks I think he did pretty good. Anyway, let's get dude, back to some this. of the conversations between him and Padme are brutal. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty gnarly. <laughs> oh, they're rough, dude. But uh, anyway, um, uh, one part that I really enjoyed that we we didn't put into the uh, recap, but I mean, we're not going to get everything in there. But no, I liked the part where. Ali was training with um, Jamshid and then Dara comes in and mm-hmm. they have just like this lengthy emotional like sparring match together and it does so much for both of them and I thought that it was such a nice part in this book where it was like it wasn't this like action filled crazy stuff going on everywhere mm-hmm. um, a lot of different emotions flying for a bunch of different people it was just these two people in this one kind of isolated fight that wasn't even really a fight but it was like it had the potential to be a real fight and it kind of was and it was right. just... it was like the equivalent of like a hip-hop freestyle battle they're like yeah. fighting but yeah. they're not actually like throwing fisty cuffs right. you know it's like which is like kind of a cool way to get out the emotion you know because you can't just bottle it up or else you'll eventually you'll draw swords i really liked ali a Me lot. Too. Um, I didn't at kind first. Soul. I was kind of annoyed every time there was an Ali chapter because I was just like, "Okay, here we go. It's more politics. Yeah, it's like, like boring. Yeah, it's just so much more politics." But um, I like that he has all this religious conviction. But it's it's Shakaborty didn't turn it into a cartoon, you right. know. And I I really enjoyed that. It was like it was such a an integral part of his character. I mean, people kind of jibed him about it a little bit, and he kind of like stuck to his guns. And it was cool to see. Not only that, but he's also amazing with a Zulfi car, like with that sword that you can t- like. How does that look in your mind? Like a classic scimitar? Yeah, kind of like a okay. curved blade. Like yeah, um, me too. But it, but thick? you can like light it on fire. Yeah, yeah, like wide, not thick, but wide. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Excuse me, I didn't mean thick, but oh, like, yeah. like a piece of rebar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> swinging a pole, metal pole. I, I really like that as well. My favorite scene, I think was Dara and Nahir's fleeing across the river. Yeah. And the river gets up. Yeah. And then they really like neat. run through the drive. It's like what a cool way to cross the river was to have yeah. the river like come alive. And we've mentioned you and I both before like our wish for more mountain sized creatures. Yeah. And that was a little bit of them. It was a, it was a solid butte. Yeah, I mean there were a couple moments like that right when Dara and Nari are escaping Cairo and this big bird creature descends on them and starts talking to them and I just thought okay cool now I'm in for something really imaginative and it stayed mm-hmm. that way really for the for the rest of the book I mean when Dara and Nari first see Devabad and you know we hadn't really got a super thorough explanation of what the city really looks like we had no. gotten kind of like through Ali's eyes you know through the eyes of somebody that spent their whole life somewhere right. um which so we are getting kind of this this view of the city but it was nice to get nari's kind of view on everything for the very first time and it was just so vivid in my head like chakra party does such a good job with detailed description that's not overdone that yeah. i don't feel like i'm just like pouring through this giant info dump of what something looks like she's very selective with her words the kind of uh, copper city sitting on a lake and then behind it is like these green kind of like forested yeah. rolling hills like uh, that all works so well totally totally i completely agree when nari gets to the city and sees it for the first time i was like perfect these are the gaps that i needed filling in because i had a couple little like gaps of my visual and she did a great job filling that in it looked really cool and still does i have a question um sure and we're going to kind of jump to the end here and we'll probably come back towards the middle, but I just, we this has been do. weighing on my brain. And if Jamshid is a Nahid, did I say that right? Yeah. Nahid. Mm-hmm. Um, if Jamshid is one of them, what's the point of Nari? Like why, like, can you just like lift her right out of this entire situation? Like if, if know. Nisreen already knew that Jamshid was a, like, and it's like, one of if the there was, lost. and it's, it's like, why are they trying to keep him a secret if Nari shows up and says she's the last one and the king is like all about it. 
Like right. I don't, I don't, under, I don't get like what I don't all get of that was. Like any of that either. I, okay, so I think the king I kind of get because he doesn't really care whether she is actually a Nahid or not. He's just like, okay, if we everyone thinks that you are, then I can have you marry my son. I can use you as a political fulcrum, basically, to like join these two peoples and make sure to kind of bridge the divide that's that's happening amongst his subjects. Right. But like. The rest not of just it, do I that with no John shit then. I, I don't know. But then, okay, because he's because he's going to marry him too. Yeah. Right? Uh, but also, but like, uh, uh, did you, know. you pick up on Jamshid and Muntadir being like lovers? No. Oh, really? It was like a one no. line thing. It was like as much. Oh. It was as it was like as much um, of a hint as like Sir Loras and Renly Baler- B- Baratheon mm. in Game of Thrones. It was like very subtle, but I'm pretty sure you know because there was that scene where Dara. Dara and, no, Dara and Ali and Munta, Muntadir get in kind of like this weird argument in that bar with Muntadir's oh, right. kind of like lady friend. And mm-hmm. then Dara kind of like reads her mind and is just like, you want all this stuff, but Muntadir doesn't want any of that. And I think that was kind of like an allusion to like, Muntadir is, it's him and Jamshid. You are lifted right out of this whole situation. You right, know, like Jamshid's sitting outside, right? Uh, he's, a, I think he's around, but he's not, yeah, yeah, he's not like direct, but I just thought that was, um, that was really cool. It was a nice, um, kind of like complication that I'm excited to see kind of come to fruition in the next mm-hmm. book, like Jamshid and Muntadir. Cause like Muntadir is a really important character in these books and we didn't see hardly any of him. Like we saw yeah. some really key conversations, but I kind of want Muntadir chapters cause he seems Me like too. honestly a lot more interesting even than Ali, who was Same pretty interesting, up. but like Muntadir has a lot of really cool qualities in that he seems like superficially this playboy. He's mm-hmm. just kind of carousing and fucking around and whatever. But there are multiple instances where he lets on that he knows way more that is going on, you know, than he lets on. There's multiple conversations that he has with Ali where he's just like, hey, man, you don't know what's going on. I do. You're so idealistic. You're kind of like blinded to what the actual reality of the the lay of the land is here. And it's it's cute, but you're getting older and this is going to start having real consequences soon. (laughs) You know, it's just an awesome older brother. Yeah, I I, I agree completely, because at first he kind of came off as like the hothead, like a little more um, like Zuko from the last airbender, you know, just like I got to swing my sword around, you know. And then he started, especially when he reveals the like corpse dungeon to Ooh, yeah, that was brutal. Yeah, that was brutal. Um, to his younger brother. And like you said, kind of tries to be like, yo, man, you're growing up. You need to know about this thing. And and a great personal risk too, right? Because his father's gonna be not happy if he re- learns that he revealed that to um Ali. And so he uh he just had a lot more depth going on, but he has that kind of warrior. Like I'm still gonna do my own thing and maybe just rush headlong into battle, sort of spirit. And I, I want to read more from him for sure. Well, I mean, uh, you said warrior, but I mean, I'm pretty sure that Muntadir hasn't been raised to fight. Oh, you're right. He's yeah. not the warrior, huh? I have him so with Zuko in my mind. <laughs> well, I really like that dynamic though. That um, like this, the head of state doesn't read or write, and he doesn't fight. He has yeah. people around him to do it for him, which is a really interesting dynamic for a society like this. You wouldn't want somebody that's in that absolute power to have all this. You want to delegate those kinds of skills to different people, which is really interesting. I like that a lot. Can you imagine being like the head of state or doing being any sort of government job whatsoever and not being able to read and write? Well, um, remember in Stormlight Archive, uh, like Dalinar has to have everything read to him. Oh, yeah, that's um, yeah cool. because huh. the uh like reading and writing is like a is like a it's feminine, a feminine art. art yeah right. and so is cooking is it cooking what's the other one i don't remember what it was oh no it wasn't cooking but it was that um men and women ate different food oh or yeah the men like have like that spicy a... foods yeah no the women had spicy foods really no the... I think was it i don't know it doesn't matter we're not talking about yeah, stormlight <laughs> i'm pretty sure it was spicy for the men. <laughs> we're talking about uh david bad yes um but yeah, and there not were a couple Star Wars. <laughs> and not Star Wars. Okay, so at the end of chapter 22, Nari, Ali, and Dara all leave. But before that, Ali and Dara fight. Like, why are they fighting? I don't remember. Like they and they have an <laughs> epic battle. I mean, Ali gets creamed, but like it's kind of a test. It's really cool because it's a testament to how awesome of a fighter Ali is. Right. Because yeah, he's, he's able to on... hold his own against Dara. Yeah. yeah. But I don't understand why they started fighting in the first place. I mean, isn't it? I mean, because um, Dara's there to take Nari away. I mean, Ali doesn't want that to happen, obviously. 
right? Okay. I, mean, I think that's the reason. Yeah, and, I think so. But what is, but, I, is Dara jealous? I don't know. I mean, what really threw me, you know, your your confusion there is valid, and I wish I had a better answer for you. But what what really threw me for a loop was, you know, Ollie kind of agrees to go with them, like begrudgingly, and which I don't get uh, either, really. Well, I don't know, but like uh, they go through this like underground tunnel onto the lake, uh, and you know, summon this boat. Um, I'm, I'm, I get all this. this is all, and then Dara says, "We've got supplies on the other side of the river. Someone was helping us." Um, so we could escape the city, and I was like, right. "Cool, this is gonna be great." You know, I've had enough of David Bad. Let's uh, let's go to some something else. Let's go to do some other stuff. And then there's this ship, like the or this armada, basically on the lake that's waiting for them. And I was like, "Oh, whoa, this is crazy." And then Ali is just like, "I'm the one that betrayed you." And it's like, "Wait a minute, how did you even? How the hell? Like, how did you know you were gonna get kidnapped? Yeah, like, how did you he know goes there for healing? Because he just got attacked." And he's like, I don't want yeah. my father to alert my father's healers, so I'm going to like go to... I don't to know Nari. what... That was really... I don't I know. No idea. But it's, it's funny, though, because like, after that initial confusion where I felt like something had happened off the page that I wasn't aware of, and maybe it will... I mean, we might get a revisit in the next book of like, yeah. you know, all the explaining... I mean, maybe there's another chapter where like a flashback or something. I don't know. Um, but I did like that kind of last fight. That was pretty cool. Uh, on the ship very cool yeah and then like i really thought ollie was dead me too he gets shot in the throat with an arrow and falls yeah. into cursed into water death like, water yeah. <laughs> into the death water like, yeah twice killed i know i wasn't even like oh no i was just like goodbye ollie that's yeah, definitely please. a wrap for you but he comes back as like a a married mermaid zombie which <laughs> the, like, this is so the fucking crazy. visual of that was because right. so, like in my yeah. mind he had like decomposed like a yeah, year kind of yeah totally. <laughs> yeah Okay, so something about that escape that I just kind of, I don't know, it made me like roll my eyes a little bit. And it was kind of like hard for me to focus on their escape. So Afshin Dara is forcing Nari and Ali to leave, right? And he's basically like oozing magical essence. Like he's, I'm pretty sure they're escaping through a wall that he is just he like, like tore it apart ripping open yeah, yeah totally. as he's going and like he's basically going super saiyan he's in god mode and behind them as they're running after he's like injured and just got done having a fight which i don't know if you've ever like had any sort of fighting but like it is one of the most exhausting things that you can yeah, possibly sure. do they're like running and they're having a long in-depth discussion and God mode up here, like ripping apart the wall. Who, like, I'm sure his hearing is probably like a little I know, heightened as I well. Also it's just like, that. and they're like talking shit about him. <laughs> <laughs> he's like not that far. In yeah, front of he's at like all. not that far. They're like, I was like, no. And he's like running while having this conversation. Like, I, I mean, can hardly talk maybe. and jog, let alone after like I'm injured. He goes there for healing, has a crazy fight, <laughs> loses. <laughs> I mean, maybe he's just, uh, he's just really, he's he's really I mean, focused. He's, very focused and very very focused yeah what do you think about the um the the cool little raft that ollie pulls up from the bottom of the i thought that was was pretty sweet yeah um well ollie doesn't dara does excuse me dara yeah but i think ollie in my brain is a genie so well um it's funny because i think that ollie maybe i was reading this 100 percent wrong but did that boat like tip somebody off like was that what happened i don't think so okay maybe i'm wrong we might just cut that out what did you think about King Ghassan? He is another unknown quantity to me. I kept being like, oh, bad guy. Oh, no, he does yeah. seem like actually genuinely care for his people. And then like, I, I don't really know. I don't. I think he's very into his job. Right. Yeah. Like he would sacrifice one of his kids for his job. And I don't know if it's out of love for his people or if it's his sense of duty. I think he has a wild sense of duty. Yeah, I think that might be it. Too. There's a legacy that the Gaziri have. You know, right? Um, they've. It's almost like the way that I was reading it is almost like the Gaziri have taken this this mantle of power and responsibility in the wake of Suleiman kind of doing what what he did. Right. Um, and it's almost like maybe he sees it as almost kind of like an opportunity, and he doesn't mm. want to squat. He doesn't want to be the one to squander, and he doesn't want his kids to be the the reason that it's squandered either. Like he sees right. a lot of opportunity in these very fractioned off peoples Mm -hmm. but um you know he you can really tell that he's trying to keep it all it's like it's like trying to keep water in your cupped hands like you know it's it's still dripping through but like what are you gonna do like let it all go i don't know i felt like he was a very interesting character like very conniving 
very on the ball most of the time. Yes. You know, he's um, a chess player. Very intense. You know, when like someone's mad at you and you'd rather they were yelling at you than kind of like that, that quiet oh, yeah. anger. <laughs> yeah. He had a lot of that energy, like throughout the entire book, um, totally. which, which makes for like a very unpredictable character. Cause I felt like at any moment he was just going to snap. Um, I liked Gisan a lot. I liked yeah, the he... chapters that he was in. Mm -hmm. And like I said, and with a lot of having, you know, when I first, when we first arrived at the city, it's like, there's a riot happening. It's like, man, I just don't know whose side to be on yet. And yeah. I think that's kind of the point, which is kind of cool. It's funny that we were talking about Star Wars just a little bit, because this kind of gave me like Force Awakens vibes. Yeah. Uh, like Nari is Rey, kind of like unknown origins, but really, really important. A little bit Mary Sue-ish, but like, yeah, a little bit. Backs it up though, you know. Like I, I don't like the critique that that Rey is a Mary Sue because it's like she's not like amazing at everything you know and, and neither is nari like nari training in the infirmary oh she she's, failed. she's she's like pretty bad at it oh yeah um, <laughs> to the point where i've like total frustration and tears and she and you know i felt for her quite a bit when she was trying to explain to nisreen like i need so much more time like i know that i'm the the last nahid and I, right, i'm like, neo right but still like you can't just like give me this magical healing remedies and make and just expect me to just understand it immediately like i'm gonna live for centuries and you want me to do this in like a matter of weeks you know being in that situation and just having somebody's life in your hands oh, not man. even just in the sense that you know, on this plane of existence, but like this whole magical, like plethora of different remedies that she has no idea how to use at all. You know, it's not just a matter of stitching somebody's cut up or at least, or even putting your hands on somebody and heal and healing them, which is what she seems to be able to do. You know, there's like potions and magical thread for wounds and things like that. She's doing magic surgery. Exactly. Yeah. She's doing magic surgery. And then it seems like you know, as frustrated and as she is and as vocal as she is about what her needs are to be able to do the job that she feels like she's been entrusted with, it's all kind of a farce anyway. So that's just kind of like kicking her while she's down, too. I felt pretty bad for Nari in, the, in yeah. that specific sense, at least. I hope that she maintains her con man spirit. I like those parts, yeah. Yeah, I, when I she's wish like, that, you're my mark. Honestly, I, I felt like Chakraborty was like really kind of keep trying to keep that throughout the book, but I wish that there were more instances of it. Yeah. And I, I appreciate the effort because I see it. It's there. But I, mm -hmm. I just wish that like maybe like Nari was walking around and like literally was like stealing stuff. Yeah, you like know? she has like, a problem and people are like, yeah, you gotta stop coming back cool. with gems. You know? Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, Nari's pretty cool. I mean, like, I did feel like her character didn't really go anywhere. No. You know what I mean? Like, she was just kind of the same person throughout the entire book, which, I mean, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but... She was an axle it, for the wheel, the just, story to kind of revolve around. Which is weird for the main POV character. Yeah. I mean, um, but I, that kind of brings me to one of kind of another thing about the book that it didn't make it bad, but it just made it, it made it kind of a slog to get through. There wasn't really much of a plot i mean what, what, what did you think about? like what did you think i mean it was about a lot of things but there was right. no i never felt like there was like this a goal uh, like a promise that was made in the beginning and a goal that they were trying to get to yes. in any sense of the word you know and it's not like they were trying to get a MacGuffin or like what i don't need that in every single book but it's like there's no big bad there's no yeah um, like ultimate kind of like place anyone wants to end up like i liked the david bad arc where nari and dara are trying to get to david bad and they're kind of like mm -hmm. things in their way and they're growing and learning about the history of the situation uh, as they go right. and then they get to david bad and then there's like this long stretch of like not really anything happening uh, of Holy. note i mean things happen obviously but it's very slow like it's very incremental like mm -hmm. somebody goes into this room and talks about this thing and then someone goes into this room and gets upset about this thing and then now they're in a bar and someone storms out and it's just like what the hell is going on right now right i agree i felt like there was chunks missing like there was just like a few parts that i was just like i don't know well, like I like what we're where we're at, and I like what we're doing, but I don't know why we're doing it, or what we're doing next, or what our goals are. I don't like it in books where someone gets specialed. They are special. 
Yeah, and then the <laughs> next minute, every freaking person is special. It's like, man, cool. We got the one person who's magic. And then all of a sudden, she's surrounded by way more magic people and a whole <laughs> city of magical people. It's like, oh, okay, cool. So she's special and super not. And then even like the one thing that she's super special about at the end is like kind of removed because she's not actually the only Nahid, right? Because it's like G, G, whatever that guy's name is. Jamshid. Jamshid, thank you, yeah. is also Nahid. So it's like... Yeah. She's not even special, special, special. She's like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I like your, I like the verb. They like, I don't like Thank it you, when yeah. characters get specialed. <laughs> like, yeah. and then I think, I mean, away. it's more, I think it's more nuanced than that for you, right? It's like, you, you don't mind it if a character gets special, special, oh, oh, like but that. you don't, you don't want them to then be thrown into like this big like, yeah. community of other special yeah, Don't people. hand someone a cup of water and be like, this is so awesome. And then throw everyone into a lake. It's like, okay. <laughs> Like, the water's not special anymore. Uh, I'm kind of struggling a little bit to understand how Jin are created and how they die and they can't have children and what? I have no idea. Okay. I don't think that Afshid, <laughs> I don't think, like in Dara's case, Dara can't have children. Jin can have children. Obviously, there's something special with Dara. So uh, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to clear this up myself and then I want you to correct me if you think okay. I'm wrong. Okay. So okay. Shafit are. Like basically half human, half jinn, right? Yes, I think okay, so. So I think um, that's safe. That is clear. If this is a city full of jinn and no humans can get there, why are the Shafit such a problem? Like, or not problem, you know what I mean? But it's like, how are they? How are they so numerous and such an issue for or issue quote unquote for? Can they? The, I almost said breed, but that sounds wrong. Can they? Can they have kids? <laughs> so even if the Shafit have kids, obviously the Shafit are having kids, but it's like. Are there more Shafiq coming in through the veil? Mm. This is what I was really confused about. So it sounds like there are lots of jinn living in these other communities outside. Um, so like where the Gaziri are from or yeah, where uh-huh. like there are, you know, there's um, Agni Vanshas from like India, obviously. Oh, right. Um, there's, there's all these different um, like factions or tribes. So like what's, what's up with Devabad? Like why... Like, it's not like all the jinn are living in this community. Right. They're all over the place. It's like, what's so special about Devabad exactly? I like, don't, why? I mean, the humans definitely can't get there. So maybe it like protects them from a Suleiman because they have the veil. But then why would anyone else be living outside of Devabad? I don't know. <laughs> I didn't I don't get know. that at I all. I don't know. Oh, Though Suleiman is a really cool word to say. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I did understand the kind of the the deva were abusing their power, so Suleiman came along. I don't know where he got the ring. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I hope that's explained later. I want to know more about Suleiman, and I'm, I guess I'm kind of predicting uh, Suleiman is probably a different thing than everybody thought he was. Totally. Maybe um, that would it would probably answer a lot of different questions. Of, of you know, because I feel like there's maybe a lot being taken for granted that happened 1400 or like 3000 years ago or mm-hmm. however long all this stuff happened. I think, you know, over the course of time, things really start to get muddled up. Um, and then you throw present conflicts in there and you're bound to have like much worse conflict uh, with totally. the combination of those two things with so like bad information and present conflict. So I am kind of curious to see if like maybe Suleiman and Dara and the Nahids. You think they're the and- one in the same? No, I don't no? think so. Because no. Dara has a ring; it's special. I don't think I don't think we've seen the last of Dara. One th- uh, one thing that was <laughs> another thing that was kind of like okay, sure, uh, was when Muntadir takes Ali down to these crypts where the sure. Nahis are buried, and I thought that was some really excellent world building, an awesome conversation between mm-hmm. these two brothers about this very Real very talk. precarious situation. Loved it, loved all of that, and then he's like, "Aha." We have these relics, and then you have this, and apparently they all have these earrings, you oh, know. Yeah. That, and it's like, wait, this we're like two thirds of the way through like this book. Like, and like... I don't. Uh, I was definitely like, wait a minute, what are the uh, why are we just hearing about this like right now? I it totally sounds. It sounds like that. it felt like it was something that was kind of tossed in, yeah. um, to solve the ending that was written. And maybe it wasn't, obviously, but is that uh, how yeah. he comes back? Yeah, that's how he comes back. I don't. Huh? Yeah, it's but yeah. like they have. It was cool. And I think it's important, obviously, um, because they have Dara's relic, right? So Dara's technically not supposed to be around at all. And that never really got answered. At least it, 
uh, not in a super satisfactory way. So I hope in the next couple of books we explore more about like, like what's up with Dara? Like why I mean, is he? That's why I think he might be Suleiman or something because he maybe he definitely was super saying at the end. Like you he was remember doing things... being Suleiman though. I don't know, man. He's got a troubled, tortured past, right, and maybe yeah. he's like half of his consciousness is like hidden inside. Maybe he pulled like a. Um, who's the guy in Islington's book with start with the C who locked his own memories away from himself? Caden, yeah. Caden, yeah. Uh, maybe pulled a Caden, you know, and like locked away his own memories because he was like, I'm a bad person. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. But I think that he is not dead. And he's certainly more than what he said because he's like, I'll tell you everything. And then he's doing things that Ali is like, what? You should not be able to like change that item into something else. Totally. Like, there are doing... multiple parts where that happens. Yeah. yeah absolutely. So. He's yeah, she's laying it on pretty shoes. thick that something's up with Dara, which I yeah. which I'm really excited to figure out. I'm I'm really super excited to find out what's up with Maniza. Let's hang out with her because she sounds yeah. awesome. She was like, she's she's supposed to be dead. She's not dead. Uh, it, obviously, there's a lot. No, yeah. Um, obviously, it's very powerful. I don't know why. It sounds like did she like fake her own death or something and like give away her child or I'm really oh, really interested to see what's up with that. I wonder if like the bad guys are going to be the good guys here in the long run. I don't think there you are know? bad or good guys. Like I think Well, I mean, they when they were being attacked on the way to the city, but it was at the Ifrit they were attacking them. Right, but maybe they have some kind of like really logical good reason for what they're like, doing. <laughs> one of them dies and she's like yeah. um she's surprised Nari's like watching her be like wow he's like mourning the loss of his friend and so like yeah i think there's i think there's not as turns out like everyone's good and they're like man there's a big misunderstanding why are we <laughs> fighting this whole time let's just uh hang out and eat some kebabs and yeah dude it's all gonna be great so we have city of brass here do you think we're going to a kingdom of copper in the next <gasps> book and then after that do you think we are going to an empire of gold uh, oh boy! There, I mean, because like other places have been um, spoken about, we haven't seen them. Um, do you think that the Kingdom of Copper maybe? Yeah, what I'm thinking is maybe it, it's like a, it's in reference to something. You know, like the Empire Copper armbands or something. I don't know, or like maybe the Empire of Gold is like what they're aspiring to or something. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know if they're actual real places. Like, what do you think? Boy, I haven't really thought about it until just now, but it does kind of seem like um, the tower that king nebuchadnezzar in the bible not the tower the statue that king nebuchadnezzar in the bible dreams about and it has different layers of its body is made from different metals and each one represents a different kingdom and the role and the strength that it has so maybe there's like i don't know because like the david bad is a brass city right yeah it's like gleaming brass so maybe mm -hmm. it is more literal i kind of think the other two are going to be more figurative or like they might have some like armbands or something you know but yeah, i uh... hope they're kind of literal that would be awesome what do you think I mean, I feel the same where I feel like it's probably figurative, but it'd be really mm -hmm. awesome if we were going to different places. Like, I don't really want to hang out in Davabad anymore. Nah, I'm tired of Davabad. There are some things that would be, it'd be cool to see tied up um, neatly, obviously. I mean, like the chef feet seem to be victims in this entire situation. Yeah. Like, um, the Shafi definitely seem to have the short end of the proverbial stick here. For uh, sure. That scene where... I think his name is Rashid, um, Ali's secretary as Cade, mm -hmm. um, kind of leads him into that. I think it's an orphanage. Um, and there's like these like sick kids everywhere and yeah, stuff. Yeah. And I kind of liked it a lot because it really like hammers home how dire the situation is and how much help uh, Ali could actually be. And it just it puts him in such a bind. It really humanized like this whole movement. And I like what Shakaborty did here where she kind of like the Tanzim is not this like faceless r rebellion that's just only serving to be a problem for the royalty right. here. I really like that they're, we're seeing a lot of different sides to it. And Ali as kind of a like a stand up guy mm -hmm. who really does want to help. But or, naive. Right. And he's inexperienced. And the um, rebellion's using my money for weapons? <laughs> I just like oh my god. I gosh. specifically Ali. told you to use it for food. <laughs> but what I kind of rebellion really is nice. this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're just like, come on, kid. Seriously. Dude, seriously. <laughs> like we're all like we've got sick children all over the place. Like we gotta do something. And he's just like, yeah. Can't you give him some medicine? That's what I paid for. <laughs> I wanna see David Bad under siege, I think. I want to see a full army attack that city. That would be cool. Of course you do. Oh man, don't you? 
Um, I, I mean, really I don't bring know them together. Would, I don't know who would do it. Like I was kind of referencing before, there's all these other um, factions in different parts of this area of the world, but um, I think all the Deva live in Devabad. Okay. Um, so that I don't think sense. there's, I don't think there's like this Deva army that's going to try to usurp the Gaziri and the um, right the uh, the Ayanle, um who are inter intermarried with the Gaziri. Uh, probably won't turn on them, but it sounds like maybe they actually are kind of. I know that. Th see, that's like one of the difficult things about this book is that it's very reflective of you know the way that politics actually are, <laughs> which is like it's always ten times as complicated as it actually seems. So nuanced. Um, it's so so complicated, and I can appreciate that, but sometimes it it's a difficult reading experience because. It's a lot. A good story does not make. <laughs> well, I don't know. Like <laughs> necessarily, com complexity is fine. If it's convoluted, it's bad. And I think the yeah. complexity and and something being convoluted are kind of a little bit different. Totally. Um, because like complexity, I can appreciate. But if something's convoluted, the reason it, I feel like it's convoluted is because the presentation made it difficult for me to remember the importance of everything mm -hmm. in relation to everything else. So it's like. There's so many things going on with this book. It's kind of like with um, uh, Lycanius. Like it's like very similar to Lycanius in the sense that it's like I want to care about the things that are happening in this, but the pool of knowledge that I'm expected to carry around throughout yes. this story um, is very, very large. And most things that are uh, very important have been kind of touched on. And we are now uh, 550 pages into this trilogy. So I'm really hoping that the second book maybe slows down a little bit and just kind of yeah, like builds starts, off. Yeah. Like really fleshes some more stuff out. Like I would be, I'd be pretty bummed if there were just like a hundred new characters introduced and yes, not that soccer Bordy does a bad job with characters. Cause I mean, there's some really, really good They're ones really in good. here for sure. Um, but I just want to like, it's that in addition to learning a whole new political, it's like when you learn a whole new political system and then all of a sudden we don't have generals. You like, we've replaced a new name for every ranking in the, in the, on the battlefield and it's like now i have to remember all of these things at the same time and it just gets overwhelming and after a while i'm like i don't actually know what's going on you know as much as i've said like there's a lot of uh confusion going on here i still i mean even especially after this conversation like i feel pretty equipped to go into the second book um just mostly because i want to find out what's going on with ali because and and obviously some more characters but like ali especially because there's that one conversation that he has with um Gassan, where Gass you know, Gassan's like, all right, I know everything you were doing. Uh, we're exiling you. And in my head, when I was reading that, I was like, oh, that's not that bad. He got off pretty easy, dude. Yeah. Like, all right, cool. And Exile then, sounds and then great. he like starts thinking about it more. And it's like, oh, this is actually the worst possible punishment he could right. give me. This is the most humiliating thing he could do. This is the lowest of the like i am basically me and then he's gonna kill me <laughs> yeah and i and it, it's gonna be by some assassin it's not even gonna be by like like in my own house or right. by my own family or something it's just some nameless faceless assassin is gonna do it for money and like just leave me to rot and like it's ah oh, man that's brutal and so i want to find out what happens with ali because it's not like i mean you're not just gonna kill him right right no right chakra party yeah yeah <laughs> Please no, don't he, kill I mean, all the like in the first he part already of the got first, pushed off book. the boat and then right, came back yeah. as reed monster man so he'll be fine <laughs> reed monster <laughs> man. Yeah. i think it'd be cool if we moved on over to like uh like india or it sounds like um the kind of like the mongol area like mongolia uh mongolian area man yeah i mean i know i said this at the beginning but it is just so refreshing to read something that's not like western european centered i mean because like obviously i'll read yeah. that stuff for the rest of my life but it's just like stories like this need to be read they need to be represented and you know pushed out so that more people are reading them because this kind of stuff is so much fun and so, it's that's why like, i want to siege can you imagine a magic carpet like rush like like 40 of them coming oh, in? oh like, man what about like four thousand of them yeah you know, like even thousands better. of magic carpets yes. that'd be really cool i mean just the descriptions of food and clothing and mm -hmm. the um you know the kinds of uh, makeup that people are wearing and you know like yeah, they're using, swords yeah they're swords and i'm getting a, a good feel for this you know because it's nice and different yeah. it's awesome it's so cool and i mean uh like senlin ascends like uh books of babel was pretty different very different from like your vicanius or 
Game of Thrones or yeah, whatever. it still had like the Western culture vibe, but it wasn't like knights and castles, you know. Yeah, it was like Western steampunk. Yeah, kind of thing. So cool. All right, so as we start winding down here, um, what do you think is going to happen in book two? Do you have any predictions at all? I think we're going someplace else. Dara's coming back. I think Ali and uh, Nari are going to f- fall in love. Really? Oh yeah. Interesting. Oh yeah, they're gonna. And I, I think, wasn't seeing it. Really? Oh, they're gonna. They're gonna. Okay. Okay. I'm feeling it. Um, cool, cool, let me cool. see. Is there anything else? I think one of the three, either father, the king, or one of his Ollie or his brother, will die in the next book. I could see Muntadir dying. Yeah. For sure. What are you uh, predictions that you have? Um. So I think we're gonna have to hang in David Bad at least partly because Nari is still there. Um, obviously doing something like some kind of oh sorry we got a sidetrack it's just a tiny bit from my prediction um what was that about gasan being a mark of nari's like at the very end like when the when the deva starts standing up and like uh, so obviously she's working him now see so hopefully in the second book because that wasn't explained at all not even no. a tiny bit um i read over that a couple times because i was just like did i miss something like did she did she do something super subtle that i didn't pick up but no i think it's just like as, i got my eye on you like i'm working you i'm working it, an angle now well it seems like she had somehow communicated to the deva community something and i don't know what yeah. that was but i hope that in the second book um we spend some more time with nari as she see i think she's kind of like joining more sincerely like this deva community that she's obviously you know she's very important to this community but like i said i mean i feel like they should just tell everybody that it's gem shit i don't know right um but yeah i'd like to see i'd like to see like where where nari ends up obviously um what I do really you think like happen with Jamshed? i don't know i hope him and muntadir can just like go get a cool like cabin somewhere and just yeah. sit this all out you know just, like make elk steaks <laughs> yeah like <laughs> like just wait for this to all blow over because jump shit is really cool most of the year is really cool. cool i hope that they uh i hope they're able to just you know go go be in love somewhere and I, I that's not to... gonna happen no it's like, not gonna one happen. of them gonna die horribly wanted <laughs> was the most different character at first i was like oh like the rogue and then i'm like oh he's like the playboy and then like no i don't know he was all over the place which i like a lot so i'm, I'm excited to see more of him he's probably the most yeah. excited i am to see more of yeah um i mean ali is uh gone he's probably in the desert somewhere so uh be cool to see i mean he seems like ali is very capable obviously he's pretty proactive um and i could see maybe someone intervening on his behalf uh, because he's still Mm. such an important character i mean like yeah he kind of helped lead an uprising of a second class citizenry but uh you know his his heart is in the right place it's an accident yeah it's an accident (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah like i don't really know i don't i mean i've got a few predictions obviously obviously like i just said for book two but i have no idea what's gonna happen to round this series out like everybody could end up going to space you know i have no clue i I wish i had a little more of an inkling me too kind of yeah like i wish i was like oh cool so we do need to get that diamond in order to conquer to lock away that murdered (laughs) and that's kind of like what bummed me out i think the most about this book is that i i finished it without really feeling like there was some kind of like mission or like thing there's yeah. no there's no like what is what is like everyone Senlin's going for his wife yeah or like uh you know there's there's white walkers massing behind the wall or <laughs> like you know i mean there's no i don't know like if this was like a 10 book series i'd be a lot more confident that something is going to crop up here pretty Same. soon but we got two more books and like i'm right. not seeing any kind of and i'm not saying that like if a book series doesn't have that that it's bad it's just what i like you know mm-hmm. it makes me excited and it makes me feel like everything that's happening has like a, a solid purpose and it's all yeah. going somewhere and i should be I don't thinking know. about it in the yeah. off time what's happening you know yeah and it's just like this this story felt very meandering but it felt like i was meandering through a setting that i was very excited to be a part of yeah. and, and witness and with some characters that i really liked and the moral ambiguity of everything was very very cool mm-hmm. there's a lot of really refreshing elements in this book yeah, i just don't quite know what path we're on i have a feeling um this will be my least favorite of the three which is 
pretty cool going into a trilogy so knowing that like um and i have read a couple other reviews where people kind of express the same sentiment as like being pretty confused but confident that this is going to be cool and then replies to those reviews that are like don't worry kingdom of copper and empire of gold are awesome but like i said kind of at the top of this episode you know with a first book in a trilogy or a series things just aren't always going to seem super clear and that doesn't mean that it's bad and it doesn't mean that uh, you shouldn't keep reading or anything like that um like i'm still very much of the opinion that these are very very good <laughs> these are I mean, super the worst good, case but... scenario they're really well written yeah chakra board is like, uh, beautiful got, a, got away with words yeah it's just uh it just felt like it kind of stumbled to get to where it was going and where it was going yeah. was not really yeah. anywhere <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But we'll see. I mean, we might be eating our words here. Maybe uh, everything in Kingdom of Copper just like puts a nice cap on everything, and then we move forward to, uh, you know, uh, some really awesome 700-page resolution. I've yet to walk away from before. a story with magic carpets being like, ah, oh, that sucked. <laughs> so I have high hopes. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that'll wrap it up for us today. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for listening to this episode of our recap uh, for City of Brass by S.A. Shacklebordy. I'm really excited to read Kingdom of Copper. I'm sure it's going to be cool. And of course, uh, Empire of Gold after we're done with that one. Yeah, thanks as always for joining us on this journey, you guys. Happy reading, folks. Bye, everybody.